Hello everyone, I am Orville Morales, campaign manager for the NJ Sugar Freed campaign and moderator of the Capacity Building webinar series, with today's topic being best practices in health communication for mental health stigma. This webinar is our third of five capacity building webinars, which will focus on the common ways we can change public perception of mental health issues, with an additional focus on how addiction is stigmatized in this new age of communication. These webinars are a part of a series of capacity building webinars that the Public Good Projects, in partnership with the Nicholson Foundation, are dedicated to providing insight on effective health communication strategies and utilization of various media tools. But first, some quick housekeeping notes. While we will be muting everyone's microphone, I do encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions throughout the presentation. Our presenter will do her best to address the question when asked, but we will leave a couple minutes at the end for questions. Also, before we end this webinar, I will open up an exit poll so we can hear your feedback on these presentations. Here with me is Erica Bonaby, Director of Health Communications at the Public Good Projects. In this role, she serves as the strategic lead for scientific direction of all health communications and research at PGP. She started out her career around 13 years ago, working primarily on topics related to tobacco and obesity. But she has also worked on projects spanning a variety of health topics, including human rights, gender-based violence, HIV, reproductive health, substance use, such as opioids, alcohol, tobacco, and many more. In this presentation, we'll be talking specifically about mental health, but one of the things that she has found in her career is that there is a lot of overlap in methodologies and ways that we approach different health problems. So although we will be focusing on one specific issue here, we hope that lessons learned can be applied to other topics that you are all working on. So our agenda today for this one hour webinar, uh, we will introduce, of course, PGP and the work that we do, uh, as well as give you some learning objectives uh, so that you can be aware of what we're gonna be focused on for the webinar. We're gonna give a review of mental health so we're all on the same page of the topic. Uh, then we're gonna dive into various communication strategies and of course, the ever so important evaluation of such strategies. We are a collection of subject matter experts in a variety of fields from public health, marketing, digital strategy, health communications, and community outreach, who are passionate and driven to improve population health. Using all of the different areas of expertise of our staff, we create collaborative community-based health campaigns. We work on a variety of issues from reproductive health, obesity, opioids, social isolation and loneliness, school wellness, etc. As a key part of our process in creating any of our campaigns, we do extensive research both academically as well as understanding the digital landscape to understand key target populations and messages that will resonate with those target populations. The four images at right are images of posts from four different campaigns. One to target mental health stigma among the general population. The second at the top, targeting African-American moms to reduce their child's sugar-sweetened beverage consumption. The one on the bottom left to increase contraception use among African-American and Hispanic teens. And then we have drunken V-Wide to reduce binge drinking among college males. A visual of our approach shows that we designed these campaigns with an understanding of both quantitative and qualitative data surrounding a given topic. We form a thorough strategy around the topic, which includes proper evaluation methods and execute on that strategy. We monitor the results, often in real time, to ensure we stay on track with our objectives. We conclude with evaluation to ensure we accomplish our goal in changing people's behavior, knowledge, and attitudes about the topic in question. With that said, I will turn it over to Erica, who will dive deeper into today's topic at hand. Great, thanks Orville for the introduction. So our learning objectives today are to go over the current literature and statistics related to mental health, to examine the best practices for health communications around mental health stigma and providing examples of campaigns that have used those strategies, and then also discussing the importance of evaluation and providing an example of our own mental health stigma evaluation that was based on our campaign that we previously conducted. Just to let you know, Orville will send these slides around so you have a copy of them. And in order to make sure that I cover all of the content that I need to, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to type them in the Zoom chat window and I can incorporate them into my presentation or we can address them at the end. 
Great, so let's get started um, talking about mental health. So according to the National Institute of Mental Health, each year 20% of adults in the US experience some type of mental health condition. So when I say mental health conditions, I'm talking about a variety of different disorders, including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, among others. The symptoms of mental health conditions generally begin pretty early in life, even if they aren't diagnosed. And by age 24, three quarters of those who will live with a chronic mental health condition have already experienced symptoms of that condition. Research has also shown that there are some demographic differences within mental health conditions, with females generally more likely to be diagnosed than males. And then also when examined by race and ethnicity, um, we see certain groups like American Indians and Alaska Natives showing the highest rates of mental health conditions at almost 30%. And then we also see um, Asians at the lowest rates of diagnosed conditions at around 14%. And we know that there are lots of reasons for these demographic differences in diagnoses. Um, many of them are based on cultural norms within specific demographic groups. I won't go too deeply into that right now, um, but this is really just to set the stage and to highlight that mental health is really experienced by and understood by people um, in a variety of different ways. And there are a lot of different nuances in these numbers um, and reasons for these numbers. I also wanted to mention at the outset the importance of understanding the difference between mental health, substance use disorders, and behavioral health. So the National Institute on Mental Health classifies addiction to drugs and alcohol as a mental health condition. So we know that substance use changes our normal behaviors, it interferes with our ability to work, to learn, um, and to form relationships with others. Um, over 20 million adults in the U.S. have a substance use disorder, and there are a lot of close connections between substance use and mental health, um, not just for illegal drugs, but for substances across the board. So having two illnesses at the same time is known as comorbidity, and it can make treating each individual disorder much more difficult. So over 9 million U.S. adults experience both mental illness and a substance use disorder at the same time. Research has also shown that adults with a mental illness are um, more likely, for example, to smoke cigarettes than other adults. And this is particularly true among those with major depression and those diagnosed with schizophrenia. And research estimates that people with psychiatric disorders pur purchase approximately 44% um, of all the cigarettes sold in the US. And smoking is believed to be one of the reasons that people with mental illnesses have more physical health problems um, than those without. So there are a lot of really close connections between substance use and mental health. Throughout the presentation, um, we will be focusing mostly on mental health, um, but we will highlight addiction when it is pertinent. Um, the strategies that we will go over are relevant for mental health as well as substance use, um, especially when we are talking about stigma. So both mental health conditions and substance use disorders are highly stigmatized, um, and we know that that stigma perpetuates stereotypes and discrimination um, and increases health disparities. So for example, of those who have been diagnosed with a mental health condition, um, fewer than half receive some sort of treatment, and we know that untreated mental health conditions can cause a variety of negative outcomes to both the individual and to society. So even when people have access to mental health treatment or care, stigma is one of the most common reasons why they don't engage in that treatment or why they end their treatment early. Stigma is defined as a set of negative beliefs and attitudes that affect the way that people with mental health conditions and substance use disorders are perceived by others. So for example, um, it has been widely acknowledged that people with mental health conditions are often portrayed as violent, dangerous or unstable, um, particularly in the media. And then people both with and without mental health problems may also then see this and blame their own problems on personal weaknesses or failings. We also know that there are various levels of stigma. So the concentric circles on the left of this slide present four of the most common types. At the outermost level is structural stigma. So this refers to discrimination against people that is based on general cultural values, norms, or stereotypes that are manifested at the societal or institutional level. So for example, discrimination in employment, finding housing, accessing and using healthcare services, um, or how they're portrayed in the media. 
Then one rung down is public stigma, which is the way that people or groups of people perceive and treat those with mental health conditions. Public stigma can be determined by personal beliefs, um, individual characteristics like race, ethnicity, gender, um, as well as general uh, stereotypes of mental health conditions. And then courtesy stigma, um, we don't often hear as much about this one, but courtesy stigma um, is incredibly important because it is what happens when the stigma is extended to people who are close to the person um, living with a mental health condition. So for example, this could be a family member, friend, or someone who works with people. Um, courtesy stigma can lead to an increase in social isolation for the person close to the one with the condition um, and decrease social support all around. We often see uh, courtesy stigma referenced in relation to those living with substance use, or we often see it in other stigmatized health issues like HIV. And then at the innermost circle is self-stigma, which is defined as uh, when someone with a mental health condition takes all the stigma that they're receiving from all the levels above it and internalizes it and believes it. Um, I wanted to note that research shows clear differences in beliefs related to substance use um, compared to other types of mental health conditions. Um, so public stigma against those with substance use disorders is significantly higher than for those with mental health conditions. People with substance use disorders are often labeled as addicts or junkies um, or are perceived to have control over their drug or alcohol use. And we see um, very often, especially in the media, that they are often treated as a criminal or a moral problem rather than a behavioral health problem, particularly for the use of illegal substances. So I think that when we talk about and we think about um, mental health and substance use, we often jump to the clinical environment. So how do we get people to access treatment more often? How do we increase clinical supports uh, for people? So for this presentation, I'd like to take a step back from that, recognizing that obviously access and utilization of treatment is incredibly important and critical to supporting the health of a population. Uh, but we also feel it's important to understand other factors that influence people's decisions um, aside from just their access to treatment. So now we'll talk about some of the key environments to impacting stigma. So in creating programs to change perceptions, um, it's key to understand specific environments that stigma can happen in. So these places that I outlined are meant to provide an overview of different locations where stigma happens and what the unique challenges are in those locations. And this can help guide places to target for uh, behavior change campaigns. The first one that I'll talk about is uh, college campuses. So most people with mental health conditions um, have already experienced symptoms by the time they reach college, whether or not their mental health condition has been diagnosed. The transition to college can carry with it some pretty unique stresses that can worsen a person's experiences of mental health, um, particularly for those who attend college away from their hometown, away from their support network. And many students have to balance the stress of school and work, making friends and dealing with peer pressures um, while coping with health issues on their own, often for the very first time in their lives. Despite the fact that these stresses are so common on college campuses, stigma is one of the top reasons why students avoid engaging in treatment or disclosing their mental health conditions to their school or friends. <clears throat> in one survey, um, almost 30% of students felt that their college wasn't supportive to people with mental health conditions and that the school didn't properly educate staff and students on mental health issues and that the staff aren't understanding when a student's mental health interferes with schoolwork. Um, and students also felt that mental health services are often cut in favor of other services or programs on campus. So college campuses represent a key unique area where stigma happens and um, where stereotypes are, um, are manifested in very interesting and different ways. Um, so if you're thinking of places where a mental health stigma campaign could be effectively run, um, a college campus could definitely be one of them. The second one is workplaces. So despite the fact that the Americans with Disabilities Act provides protections against discrimination, um, employers, uh, research has shown that employers are less likely to hire someone who has disclosed a mental health condition. And people with mental health conditions report being turned down for a job due to their mental health. Um, the most common reasons that research has shown for not hiring someone with a mental health condition is the perception that they um, either lack the competence to work at a high level or under stressful situations that they may be unpredictable, dangerous, or threatening to other workers, um, that people with mental health condi conditions shouldn't be working, 
um, that they may have high rates of absenteeism or they may require more administrative oversight. And then on the other side, people with mental health conditions report experiencing more micromanagement, um, lack of opportunities for advancement and social exclusion or being the subject of gossip among coworkers. Um, and this is particularly true for those who may have to take a medical leave from a job. Um, when they come back, they often experience a great amount of stigma from their employers. Um, these statistics are based on research in the field and definitely don't necessarily represent um, workplaces at large, but it's important to know that this is a key place where stigma happens. And then the last one here is the mass media. So the media is in the unique position of not only reflecting the views and beliefs of society, but also changing and shaping them. So research has shown that the negative ways mental health conditions are portrayed in the media have an impact on the public perceptions of mental health and stigmatizing beliefs. Descriptions of mental health in the media are often based on misinformation. Um, they're connected with stories about violence, especially around conversations um, around gun violence, as we've recently seen. And they're often exaggerated to appear more dangerous. Media descriptions often portray a person living with a mental health condition as someone that needs to be protected um, or someone who will harm themselves or others. And news stories are often sensationalized or exaggerated um, in order to attract viewers, which is their ultimate goal. Um, several large scale studies have actually examined um, media stories around mental health and they found that the most common theme discussed was around dangerousness or violence which was often placed on the very front page of the newspapers or highlighted um, as a main story um, in order to sell papers. So these are just three locations that are key unique places where stigma happens. There are obviously many others, for example, in primary and secondary schools, um, but this is really just kind of meant to serve as a guide to show how stigma is experienced differently, not only among specific populations, but also in specific environments. And each of these environments um, is really unique and really merits its own um, individual stigma reduction campaign. So hopefully some of the strategies that we'll talk about um, could potentially be applied to a campaign in these areas. Great. So now that we have a good foundation um, about understandings around mental health stigma, the places it often happens, um, we'll shift to talking about evidence-based communication strategies. I'll use three of PGP's campaigns and other established campaigns so I can provide an example of some of the innovative and different ways that we can use each of these strategies. And I really tried to create this as a way of supporting the work that you all are already doing and helping to inspire creative ways to apply best practices um, to the work that's already being done in your area or inspiring new work. So the first strategy I'm going to talk about is called an education-based strategy. So education-based strategies include mental health literacy and awareness campaigns. Um, they focus on raising awareness, correcting mis misinformation, and contradicting stereotypes. One of the most commonly used education strategies is the in-person training program Mental Health First Aid, which teaches participants about mental health conditions and how to respond to problems or crises. The program was originally developed in Australia and has been adopted in the US and globally. Evaluations of mental health first aid show that the program successfully increases knowledge about mental health and has po positive effects on decreasing negative attitudes and increasing supportive behaviors toward people with mental health conditions. And the second example of an education-based campaign is Therapy Pets, which is the campaign that PGP created in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente using an education-based approach to tie mental health messages in with one of the most commonly shared pieces of content online, pictures and videos of adorable pets. So for the Therapy Pets campaign, we wanted to do an education-based approach a little bit differently. So Therapy Pets is designed to reach a broad audience of people who might not already be interested in mental health, um, giving them kind of light touch, general messages about mental health education. Pet owners are invited to submit photos and videos. So all of the images you see here are from people who are passionate about their pets, um, not necessarily about mental health. Pets are then paired with mental health messages. So the pet is the one who's delivering the educational message to the viewer. And the reason why we did this is because we know that almost 70% of households are pet owners. 
Um, 65% of pet owners post on social media about their pets. And being a pet owner myself, I can definitely attest to this and all of my social media followers will agree. Um, Therapy Pets is growing pretty quickly. We have around 100,000 fo 100, followers um, in the past year and the followers really like the pairing of pets and mental health. I think when we normally think about education-based campaigns, we kind of think of the more straightforward delivery of information, which is important, like mental health first aid is, is, has shown to be a really effective program. Um, we wanted to show this campaign as an idea of one way that we can deliver information using a creative approach and reaching people who might not already be interested in the topic itself. So we're reaching people who are interested in pets um, and hopefully we can get them to be interested in mental health after they see the campaign. Okay, and the next one is called a contact-based strategy. So a contact-based strategy promotes contact between those with and without a condition. Research shows that a lack of contact with people who have mental health conditions um, and substance use disorders leads to increased distrust, fear, and desires for social distance. So contact-based programs focus on raising awareness of mental health through contact. This can be used to increase feelings of commonality, um, to decrease stereotypes, and it shows real people who are capable and doing well, or it allows people to read and understand someone else's story. Repeated contact has been shown to be more effective than a one-time or a limited contact, suggesting that the strategy should plan for multiple interactions with the intended audience. And it's really important to note that this strategy relies on the self-disclosure of a mental health condition or of a substance use disorder or whatever topic you're looking at, um, which can carry with it itself some potential risks if a person experiences stigma or discrimination because of that disclosure. Um, despite this risk, research uh, results of contact-based programs have shown to be really promising. Um, some studies have shown that they are more effective in changing attitudes and intended behaviors compared to just education alone, which is um, really heartening. This is often done um, through the use of personal stories or ambassadors. So for example, Time to Change is a UK mental health stigma initiative. It's one of the longest running and most evaluated in the world. So Time to Change invites people to share their personal stories about mental health so that people who don't have a mental health condition can read them and can understand their stories. We also see this approach in other topics um, aside from mental health. For example, the Tips for Former Smokers campaign uses the stories from former smokers who are living with smoking-related diseases and relates the toll that these conditions have taken on them. Um, the campaign also features non-smokers who've experienced health effects due to the exposure of secondhand smoke. CDC estimates that um, almost uh, more than 16 million people who smoke have attempted to quit and about 1 million have quit for good because of the Tips campaign. And then finally on the slide, we have um, Like One Another, which is PGP's contact-based campaign. Like One Another is a stigma reduction campaign that, similar to Therapy Pets, utilizes user-generated content from people living with mental health conditions. So when I say user-generated content, I mean that all of the content that you see here um, on the next slide actually comes from individuals who are submitting their own photos and videos. So Like One Another is designed for people who are more ready for a mental health campaign. So we initially talked about Therapy Pets, which was really aimed at people who were interested in pets, not necessarily mental health. This one is kind of taking it a step further. So this campaign um, exposes people to those who are living with mental health conditions and emphasizes the commonality between those who have and those who don't have mental health conditions. Uh, people are invited to share their stories, um, and these same people submit photos and videos, um, which are paired with the story and an educational message about how we are, we are all more like one another than we are different. Um, like one another targets those who already care about mental health, so it's kind of taking them a step further. In the past year, Like One Another has collaborated with over 200 people living with a variety of conditions, um, kind of across the board, and the campaign shows a photo or video of a new person each day, um, almost every day. The campaign reaches almost a million people every month with negligible paid media and is quickly growing. And I think one of the strengths of this campaign is that it really taps into people's desires to tell their stories and to make a difference. That feeling of wanting to make a difference and wanting to tell your story is often incredibly powerful and people naturally want that, but they don't necessarily know where to go for that. 
Um, this doesn't need to require tons of money. All of the people that participate across our campaigns, so both in Therapy Pets and in Like One Another, um, don't receive any compensation. They are just doing it because they are interested in the topic and they feel passionately about um, mental health and they want to change their conversation around stigma. And the last uh, strategy that I'll talk about is an advocate-based strategy. So the World Health Organization highlights advocacy as an important method of eliminating mental health stigma and supporting those with mental health conditions. Advocacy for mental health conditions began decades ago as a way for those with mental health conditions and their families to correct misinformation and to lobby for policy change and protections. So the advocacy strategy is often used with the aim of impacting policy decisions on both an, a local and national level. Historically, we see that stigmatized groups have found protection due to changes at the legislative level because of advocacy efforts, um, for example, through the Civil Rights Act or through the Americans with Disabilities Act, which were really led by advocacy groups. Um, but aside from its policy impacts, advocacy can also increase awareness of mental health among the general population. It can empower people to become mental health champions, and it can encourage contact between those with and without mental health conditions. So for example, uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, has used advocacy strategies to encourage people to become involved in efforts to reduce stigma by becoming stigma busters. You can become a stigma buster on their website. We also see Mental Health America, which is the leading community-based nonprofit dedicated to addressing the needs of those with mental health conditions. Um, they offer multiple ways to get involved in advocacy efforts, uh, both online as well as in person. And they also have public position statements that cover a large number of policy issues around mental health. We also see a lot of advocacy work being done within New Jersey itself. Um, as many of you know, many towns, universities, churches, schools, companies, hospitals um, across the state have adopted resolutions designating themselves as stigma-free. And many towns have also created committees um, to help people with mental health conditions feel less isolated um, or have created classes or panels to help educate employees and residents on issues surrounding mental health. And then the last campaign on the slide is PGP's campaign, which we call Mental Health Champions. So our campaign doesn't necessarily promote the adoption of any specific policies, but rather it promotes people to become more involved in mental health and to become a mental health champion. So Mental Health Champions is designed for those who want to do more than just learn about educational mental health messaging, um, or they want to do more than just view images and videos of people with mental health conditions. The campaign is really aimed toward those who want to learn more and do more, uh, but they just might not know how. So people sign up to receive weekly texts or emails, and the messages that they get contain um, really pretty art um, with mental health messages and facts that they share with their own networks on social media. So this is a way for people to say that they are mental health champions and to tell all of their families and friends. To date, we have over 400 people signed up to receive the artwork, which is then shared among all of their own personal networks each week. Um, and before the webinar, I received a good question about how to get people who are busy to attend educational events, um, especially one is to raise awareness about reducing stigma. And I thought that was a really good question. So I think Kind of aside from my general um, suggestions of offering transportation and food, um, I think that raising awareness events often end up gathering these groups of advocates who may already be convinced of the importance of your topic. Um, so I was thinking that one, may, one way um, that might be effective at getting people who aren't at this advocacy level to an event um, is first getting them involved in some easier way. For example, submitting a photo to like one another or to therapy pets. This is something that they can do at their home, they can do in their spare time, they can do with their phones. Um, and then when you have them already participating, they'll be much more likely to then take a step further and go to an event, um, especially if it's like, for example, four people who have participated. Um, we can't do this because therapy pets and like one another are national, but I think it would be amazing to gather all of the hundreds of people who have participated in our campaigns um, at an event. They've already gotten involved in some small way. They're interested in the campaign. Um, hopefully they had a good experience. They're now really interested in mental health stigma and what they can do, and they're looking for ways to get involved. I think it's really hard to ask people who, to participate in an in-person event if they haven't already done something beforehand. So even if it's as small as sending a picture of a pet to the Therapy Pets campaign, 
Um, it's something that gets them interested before the event happens. So I think that can be a really powerful tool to get people to um, show up when they are incredibly busy. So several of the campaigns that I showed you don't adopt just one strategy. So for example, the stigma-free advocacy efforts in New Jersey also adopt an education-based tone and Time to Change also combines their education and contact-based strategies. Um, research has shown that the use of multiple strategies is often more effective than using just one. So that is what PGP did with all of the three campaigns that we just reviewed. Therapy Pets, Like One Another, and Mental Health Champions all work under the umbrella of Action Minded, which is the overall campaign that incorporates all of the three best practices for stigma reduction. So each of the campaigns and each of the strategies is its own sub-campaign for audiences along a spectrum of interest in mental health. So we're reaching people across different levels. Those who are not ready for a mental health campaign, but want to look at a cute picture of a basset hound with a mental health message in there. Those who are more ready for a mental health campaign and want to learn more. And then those who are ready to shout from their social media hilltops that they are mental health champions. So this is all to say that I think there are many creative ways to take the strategies and make them work for you um, in whatever environment you're working in or whatever population you're targeting. These strategies applied at the outset um, can help make sure that you're creating a grounded campaign um, that can more effectively make change. And then I also wanted to note it, um, that we, you know, we are looking all the time at new campaigns that are in the field, and I am consistently noticing some gaps that I see. So if you're thinking about where you can have an impact in a way that isn't already being done on a large scale, um, these are some ideas. So for example, Spanish language campaigns. Um, campaigns for mental health are almost overwhelmingly done in English. I think there are a lot of cultural nuances with Spanish speaking populations and their understandings of mental health. And this one in particular would be a really good target for a local level, given that different Spanish speaking countries can have different understandings of mental health. So having a local knowledge of these nuances is incredibly important. Other targeted campaigns um, could be toward different demographic groups. So like I showed at the beginning, people have different views toward mental health depending on their gender, their race or ethnicity, the place they live, their upbringing, um, and most of the campaigns that we see are targeted toward a general population, including the ones that PGP has created. So there's a need to really look at specific groups, um, given that ideas of mental health can vary so vastly from group to group and area to area. And again, I think this is a really good one for a local level campaign. And then also, um, I notice a gap in campaigns that are directed towards specific high stress or high occupation groups. Um, two that immediately jump out to me all the time are teachers or people who are working in the education system, and then also military. Um, these two occupations can be incredibly high stress um, and having a mental health stigma campaign among these groups could be really valuable. Um, and we also see, for example, um, blue collar jobs that are physically demanding, um, particularly for substance use or opioid campaigns, um, that could also be an area of uh, gaps to fill. Great, so I'll kind of round out the presentation with a conversation on one of my favorite topics, um, which is evaluation. So the goal of evaluation is to outline how an organization proposes to track progress in an intervention or program, which we measure by analyzing changes in specific indicators of knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors related to the topic of interest. So for this case, we are going to talk about mental health stigma. Findings from an evaluation can be used to refine the development of effective interventions and are a really critical piece in understanding the successes and places for improvement. So in this section, um, I'll present you with the evaluation that PGP conducted of our three campaigns, um, which, uh, like I said, are under the umbrella of action minded. Great. So um, one thing that I wanted to note is that um, Evaluations um, ideally should be delivered um, in a baseline survey that is conducted before the campaign or program starts and then a follow up survey that can be conducted either after it ends or on a yearly basis, something like that. The baseline survey would establish kind of a foundation of knowledge, attitudes and behaviors and the follow up survey can examine trends and changes from that baseline. 
Um, one thing that is good to know is that we, um, we generally don't try to create our own questions. <laughs> we most often use validated measures that have been used and created by researchers in the field and are agreed upon to be good indicators of stigma change. So for example, on the right hand side here, um, those are all of the scales that we use to create our own mental health stigma evaluation. None of the questions in the box were created by us. Um, using questions that other people have already developed gives your evaluations more scientific weight. And you also don't need to recreate the wheel with your questions, which is something I love. Obviously, there are definitely questions that you may be interested in measuring, which you don't have validated questions for. You can absolutely add those in, but in general, we tend to stick as closely as possible to the questions that are already out there. So um, in addition, in the case of a campaign or a program with a brand identity or a name, at the follow-up uh, survey, we also include questions that ask about awareness of the campaign. So for example, have you heard of the health campaign Action Minded? Um, for those who respond that they have heard of the campaign, you can then analyze the data at follow-up to compare not only the baseline to follow-up change over time, but also at the end, comparing data among those who have and haven't heard of the campaign. So in the next slides, I'll go over an evaluation that we did of our campaign to kind of show the power and the importance of evaluation and the different ways that you can present your results. So the first questions that we looked at here were related to perceptions and desires for social distance, which is defined by a person's willingness to interact with someone with a mental health condition. This scale is one that is widely used by both researchers as well as in evaluations of other mental health stigma campaigns. As you can see in the results um, for pre to post campaign, which is on the left, um, we saw uh, increases in willingness to interact with someone with a health, mental health condition. Um, increases were significant across desires to live with, work with, live nearby, um, or continue a relationship with someone uh, with a mental health condition. And uh, we also saw when comparing people at follow-up who were aware of or weren't aware of the campaign, we see people aware of the campaign significantly more likely to agree with all of the questions. And I think across all of the questions that we ask in our surveys, um, when we look in the research, the scale is very often referred back to as an important indicator of stigma change. So the fact that we saw significant shifts here in the scale, um, both pre to post campaign, as well as at follow-up within campaign awareness, is a very good indicator that stigma has changed. And this is another reason why we really highly recommend using questions that other people have created, because then you can have the scientific weight behind you to make that statement. The next questions we asked about gauged different perceptions on attitudes toward mental health conditions, including beliefs around susceptibility to having a mental health condition, um, that anyone can have a mental health condition, um, abilities for people to be given responsibility, potentials for recovery, and perceptions of dangerousness. Across all of these questions, we saw significant improvements, both in the overall sample from baseline to follow-up, which is on the left, as well as by campaign awareness, which is on the right. I think one measure um, that is particularly notable is the perception of dangerousness, which improved about five percentage points um, in the overall sample on the left and showed a gap of almost 15 percentage points um, on the right. So during the past year, um, we unfortunately saw several large scale mass shootings and press around the March for Our Lives, um, which are events that are traditionally followed by associations of people with mental health conditions as being violent or dangerousness um, or dangerous. Um, so the fact that we still saw a significant improvement in this measure is particularly notable. Um, and this is another reason why we really highly suggest doing evaluations of all programs because you can kind of tease out those nuances. And then the final slide on evaluation um, is about uh, self-efficacy. So how confident do people feel in providing advice or support to a friend with a mental health condition? So in the overall sample on the left from pre to post, we saw significant increases in confidence, which was also shown among those who are aware of the campaign on the right. Encouragingly, we also saw significant increases in people having actually provided support to their loved ones in the past six months, so during the campaign period. Um, across the board, we found increases in providing support in person, over the phone, via social media, and via email. Um, we found those all increase. And those who were aware of the campaign reported more instances of showing support than those who were not aware of the campaign. So what this all means and what our evaluation allows us to tell is a story that 
you know, within, within the past year, using validated measures and scales and using the same methodologies that are used by every other large-scale behavior intervention, we saw a real shift from fewer desires for social distance, improved attitudes toward key mental health condition measures, and then we saw that follow up through improved self-efficacy to support someone else, and then actually seeing that support shift. Um, so we are able to use our evaluation to tell a really strong story of people actually changing their behaviors, not only in the general population, but also among those who were aware of the campaigns. So then my final slide here um, is really just kind of recapping the power of evaluation. So using validated measures that other researchers and organizations use provides the ability to have kind of a scientifically backed proof to show changes over time in a specific area. It can also help organizations improve their program design and implementation to make sure that they are directing resources and messaging toward uh, groups that need it or toward messages that are um, in need of changing. It also monitors progress toward achieving objectives and gives a better understanding of a target audience's knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors on a specific topic. Um, I think evaluation um, is often kind of put off toward the end and seen as something that would be nice to do if you had money. Um, it can also be done um, locally using surveys that are done in person. Um, so it can also be something that is not necessarily an enormous um, time suck and use of money. Um, I think it's incredibly important even getting a survey of 100 people to, to really understand what your population thinks. And to help um, kind of further the, the discussion, I included a link here to uh, CDC's evaluation documents and workbooks, which I think are really helpful to give tools for um, how to take evaluation theories and processes and adapt them to your specific circumstances and give some ideas for ways to do that that aren't um, super uh, time intensive and aren't super expensive. So that was really the end of my presentation. I'm definitely happy to um, hear any questions anyone has. Please feel free to um, type them in the chat and um, Orville, feel free to ask any questions if you have as well. And I think maybe while people think of questions, I actually have one that somebody wrote to me um, in an email that I thought was also really helpful. Um, someone asked, um, what do you do for people who are not necessarily connected to social media or the internet? Um, all of the campaigns that PGP does um, in general are mostly digital campaigns. So they are done through social media, through the internet. Um, but I definitely want to highlight that we don't see technology as kind of the be all end all for communicating health information. I do think that one of the things that I want to caution is um, making sure that we're not just using, you know, billboards or bus ads um, just because that seems like the thing to do, but really being intentional about it. I think traditional media like billboards and bus ads can be really helpful if you know that your population is there. Um, for example, I live in San Diego, so nobody takes the bus um, or very few people take the bus. So that would definitely not be something that I would invest in, uh, but in an area that has maybe a better transportation system and you know that your target population uses it, that's absolutely something we would suggest. Um, another thing is we are doing um, a, a new campaign in a very small town and we are trying to raise awareness about addiction. So one of the ways that we are going to do that is um, creating uh, lawn signs and bumper stickers. It is a very small town, everybody knows each other, um, somebody puts up a lawn sign and then everybody else wants to know what it's about. I would never suggest that in a large city where a lawn sign can definitely um, get drowned out. Uh, but for this small town, that works. So I think when you're thinking about in-person or um, kind of on the ground traditional media approaches, it's just really important to know where your people are. What local newspapers are they reading? Um, what, uh, what radio stations are they listening to? And people who are working in these local community organizations really have a leg up because you, you can have access to those people. It really kind of takes a focus group to sit down with 10 people and to talk about where they get information. That can be incredibly powerful. So I definitely wanted to um, mention that because I think that there is a tendency to just kind of believe that you can throw up a Facebook page and make change when, you know, that's really not the case necessarily. It, it really has to be tailored to um, whatever, uh, whatever situation you're in. 
Hey, Erica, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. I can hear you. Hi, Erica. Uh, my computer was not being a fan with the microphone for me. <laughs> uh, but I'm seeing a question here from Ms. James that they are a uh, mental health resource center and they're wondering how they can partner with our organization in an effort to not reinvent the wheel. Yeah, um, that is a really great question because I think that um, we, so one of the things that PGP does as a company is we try to partner with organizations to provide them with content um, that fills gaps in their needs and provides them with kind of high quality, nice looking um, images. So for our last year's campaign with Kaiser Permanente, um, we invited local organizations to for example, become a mental health champion. So then you could take those images and use them in your own organizations. Um, and we can also um, offer, uh, we also offer uh, partners with, um, we also offer partners with different materials that we can create specifically for them. Um, so this is definitely something that we completely agree with. I think that there is a need for more partnerships in the field and not fewer. Um, so last, Last year, I think we partnered with um, maybe 40, 30 or 40 organizations um, to provide them with uh, content that they could use themselves um, around mental health stigma. So you could put your logo on it, you could put your colors on it, all that stuff. It's really meant to kind of fill gaps in what specific partners need. Um, so that is definitely something that we want to do. We also offer all of our content for mental health champions um, on a download center. Um, so you can access that and actually download all of the um, information that we have used throughout the year. Um, there is no cost for that. We are really passionate about making sure that it's, you know, you, you don't need to have $20,000 to pay for our content. So I can have Orville send around a link where you can actually see all of the content that we've created for Mental Health Champions. You can download it, you can use it, um, and that can help kind of fill some gaps. I see another question about information regarding children. So that is a really uh, good point. We actually, um, as a company for this contract, made the decision to not focus on under 18 um, for various reasons. Um, so our campaigns are really geared toward those over 18. Um, so I don't have any specific information around children and we specifically decided not to focus on that um, just because I think there are a lot of big differences between how you communicate health information to children or to parents about children, um, that sort of thing. I think that the, the messages that we're communicating in our materials could absolutely be, um, could resonate with parents of children, uh, but we're not specifically talking about how do you talk to children about mental health or how do you support mental health among children. So that's definitely not one of our areas. Uh, to follow up on a question from Ms. Plaza about the cost for partnership, uh, one of the things about uh, the Public Good Project is that we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, so we usually partner with foundations, Department of Health, uh, and other community groups uh, to design various campaigns. Uh, in New Jersey with the Nicholson Foundation, we are working on the Sugar Sweet and Beverage campaign, uh, as well as doing work around uh, tobacco with New Jersey Prevention Network. And one of the things that we would love to do uh, a campaign specifically around mental health safety in New Jersey, uh, but like, like Erica mentioned, we also have some content that we can share around mental health stigma of other campaigns that we have done outside of New Jersey. Uh, but we can certainly have a deeper conversation of how we can implement a deeper campaign around mental health. But one of the fortunate things of this is that we're also into sharing information. So if we can get, uh, um, as we develop our partnership, we get permission to use some of that content in other campaigns outside of the state. Uh, so I'll definitely follow up with resources related to that uh, so you can take advantage of uh, as well. And if you're open to having an uh, even further conversation about uh, what would a campaign like that look like in New Jersey, I'll definitely open to have that conversation uh, with anyone. Um, with that, uh, any final questions that anyone may want to share before I close? Amen to that, Ms. James. Um, <laughs> really, and, and it cannot, it, as you can see, there's so many different approaches to address this topic and other topics that affect our communities. Uh, but it's really, the importance of decreasing mental health stigma cannot be overstated. 
Um, and I really do hope that this webinar allowed you to develop some creative and effective ways to address the issue uh, and other issues that you may have as you work in your respective area. And I also want to emphasize uh, that even though we share some campaigns uh, that are nationally focused or multi-state focused, uh, I want to encourage for you to consider being um, focused on the fact that in, even if in your own community, if you have a group of folks that you can uh, get some information before you launch a campaign, get a general uh, uh, baseline of how are, are people's attitudes uh, around this issue, and then after your campaign or program is over, tracking it and seeing that result, because if, if there's one thing for sure that funders do like seeing is results. Uh, so we cannot overstate how important evaluation is of your uh, outreach campaign, social campaigns, digital campaigns, and what have you. Uh, and with that, we have a, a, another series of questions if you want to take that, Erica. Yeah, sure. So this is kind of related to um, something that I touched on during the presentation of how do you get people who are busy or who aren't ready um, to attend educational events? Um, I think it's that can be a huge challenge. I think that one way to look at that is really um, how can we involve people at a smaller level in their own homes on something uh, before we actually ask them to go out of their way and join a community event? So um, for example, uh, for therapy pets and like one another, um, submitting a picture of a pet um, or submitting a picture of yourself and then uh, becoming a mental health champion. Um, and then as an advocate, you're much more likely to be interested in attending something in person. So it's really kind of taking people along that spectrum of, you know, how do you get them interested? You just have to do a brief education um, online, uh, having them submit something like a picture of their pet, then taking them along the spectrum of becoming more interested, seeing people who have mental health conditions, and then finally following that up with the advocacy piece. So I think it's really important to make sure that people um, aren't overwhelmed or they don't like not understand what's going on um, and giving them some background and things to do before they actually are asked to attend an event. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And yep, food. Everybody loves free food. <laughs> um, I can definitely agree with that. And I think um, transportation or transportation vouchers um, can often be helpful. Um, but yeah, I think definitely if there is a food component, um, that is always something that helps people get there. I think one thing we also hear a lot of is um, childcare. So a lot of people aren't able to do things because they don't have anywhere to put their kids or they would have to get daycare. So I actually, um, when we have focus groups, we try to um, have somebody there who actually is supposed to just watch children. Um, so that can often allow parents time and space um, to be able to attend those things. So I think thinking about childcare is also a, a really important point. Uh, I also want to add to that, um, since I've spent a lot of time doing community uh, organizing work over the last uh, 15 years, one of the things that I learned is it's also important uh, partnering with people who have uh, populations that get together. Uh, the faith-based community is one such uh, group, also uh, local community organizations, boys and girls clubs, and when, uh, where people are coming together and sharing uh, such information that is relevant to them, uh, especially about the issue that you're trying to educate them on. Um, it's important to understand who you're trying to encourage to attend these events. Um, you know, are, is there a very specific population? And I wouldn't mind giving uh, uh, some extra advice on it uh, in more detail, because uh, I know we're about to hit uh, three o'clock and I want to make sure uh, that we get a, a quick exit poll from any, everybody to get a sense, but don't hesitate to reach out um, to me uh, in particular because it also depends on uh, the community and how cohesive the various organizations within the community are that will be open to allowing you to come in and talk to uh, their population. So you can share uh, this information. Um, but it's certainly, as I mentioned, this issue cannot be overstated of how important it is. And I'm really, really grateful for everyone uh, to participating with us. Um, Oh, that's another great question, tips to generate interest from groups. The, my immediate reaction is it depends on the group. Uh, every group is different. Uh, case in point, if it's just a different group that speaks a different language, naturally what will make them interested is going to vary. Um, so feel free to shoot me an email. I can give you some insight on that. Uh, but understanding your audience is extremely important. That's where doing research on what's important to your audience uh, is extremely important. 
Uh, so with that, Erica, do you have any uh, last words that you want to share? Uh, in the meantime, I will launch uh, the exit poll that you can fill out. Sounds great. Yeah, and definitely feel free to shoot Orville questions if you have any. I'm happy to continue this discussion offline. So with that, please uh, answer any final questions. Uh, I'm sorry, the exit poll. And we are very, very grateful for your time today.